the U.S. Navy SEALs count themselves among the most prized human assets available to the United States government. Their value is indisputable, and everything is always done to make sure that they receive whatever resources they want for their missions, no matter how rare or expensive. They can cause maximum damage to enemy operations, and they can do it undetected. However, they're still essentially just light infantry. Without adequate support, they won't be effective. In this age of high-tech combat, being a special forces operator is a more demanding job than ever. Their lives, therefore, have only become more valuable. That's why we'll be looking at how in the coming years, the U.S. Special Forces Command plans to send Navy SEALs anywhere and at any time completely undetected and safe, and exactly why such a thing is so important. Let's dive in. Light infantry man with special skill sets. Despite all the fanfare and the mythic status that any member of any Special Forces unit has, they are essentially still light infantry. The first thing you think of when you hear the word Special Forces is a couple of guys all decked out in protective wear, faces obscured by helmets or sunglasses, and maybe a tricked out assault rifle. You probably also imagine a light buggy or cool looking off-roader beside them. This is not the reality. These troops don't hold territory, the thing that actually wins wars. That's the job of the regular mass infantrymen, along with tanks and air support. While the types of missions that Special Forces units are responsible for completing vary from unit to unit, their tasks generally involve going behind enemy lines and achieving a very specific objective. These usually involve disrupting supply lines, assassinating key figures, destroying bridges, vehicles, espionage, and even organizing guerrilla forces. Ideally, they'd have air support or regular forces ready to step in if they fall into a particularly bad situation. But quite frequently, this isn't the case. World War II saw both the Germans and the British Pioneer Commando troops, with many of those on the British side organized under the then nascent Special Air Service. In these early days, the casualties they suffered were horrific. This was especially the case in 1942's Operation Chariot, 1944's Operation Overlord, and Operation Market Garden that same year. Despite their martial prowess and skills, it was clear that they couldn't be used in a regular infantry formation capacity if left unsupported. Most importantly, their targets had to be chosen wisely, and everything should be done to make sure they get to their targets safely. They needed to be prioritized for getting any sort of transport or supplies needed for that to happen. With these lessons, along with observations gathered from how the secret services of all the Allied countries organized guerrilla resistance movements and psychological warfare efforts, the U.S. decided that their special forces units would be focused towards these tasks. From this, the Army Special Forces or Green Berets were formed, first organized as the 10th Special Forces Group. The U.S. Navy SEALs would soon follow, organized in 1962 out of the Navy's Underwater Diving Teams, or UDTs, History of SOF Transportation. To understand why the Navy SEALs need their own submarines, we need to understand how U.S. Special Forces units were previously delivered to their objectives. During the Vietnam War, U.S. Special Forces teams were inserted by friendly ground units into safe areas via helicopters and planes typically the C-47. Despite the fact that all the necessary precautions and intelligence would be taken to ensure safety, the North Vietnamese still managed to catch many teams in ambushes. Perhaps the most devastating encounter was the Battle of Lang Ve, in which a Vietnamese tank unit sent to attack Marines ended up running into a Special Forces base completely by surprise. While most of the casualties were South Vietnamese troops and native guerrillas, 10 Green Berets were lost in the battle, and the capture of the base logically proved to be the end of any Special Forces activity in the region. The military intervention in Vietnam cost the U.S. approximately 900 operators, a staggering price to pay for a conflict so far from home against determined farmers and students who had taken up arms. The Navy had been taking notes around the same time, the UDTs before them had already been using small single or two-man submersibles to get close to their targets from sea, but none of these were standardized. 
1972 came and the Mark 7 was introduced, which had support for the SEALs using them in the form of a navigation system and dedicated storage locks in which weapons and other essential items were kept. Since 1983, the Mark 8 redesignated as the SDV or SEAL delivery vehicle has been used. Most notably, they were instrumental in deploying the SEAL teams that performed critical offshore operations against the Iraqi Armed Forces in Operation Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. With the addition of being able to move completely submerged and undetected, the vehicle could carry six fully equipped SEAL operators. It was propelled by electric motors run by rechargeable batteries. When it came to navigating the depths, the vehicle was equipped with a Doppler Inertial Navigation System DINS, forward-looking obstacle avoidance sonar OAS system, and a submarine rendezvous and docking system RDS that assisted in recovery to the host submarine that it was deployed from. No expense was spared in keeping these operators safe from the moment they left their mother ships and until they reached their area of operations. It also had the added benefit of being capable of surveillance, albeit with very limited options. This was showcased in a clandestine deployment to Somalia in 2003 for spying on local Al-Qaeda cells. The SDV was a great solution. The only problem was that its use required that their mothership submarines get closer. Special Forces Command dreamt of a way to position the submarines much further away from the target for the ideal safety conditions. A long-range transportation solution was therefore sought in the ASDS, or Advanced Seal Delivery System, designed by Northrop Grumman in the 2000s. However, the design was deemed inefficient, and the Navy quickly found that it cost way too much to operate and run. This leads us to the up-and-coming DCS, or Dry Combat Submersible, the most awaited piece of equipment in Navy SEAL history. Enter the Dry Combat Submersible. In development since the early 2010s, the most important details of the DCS are still classified, although we can tell that it is to have a displacement of roughly 30 tons and is to be 39 feet long. What we do know for sure is that when operating at a speed of 5 knots and relying on its all-electric propulsion system, the stated maximum range of this vessel is approximately 66 nautical miles. It boasts the ability to submerge to depths of approximately 330 feet 100 meters. Finally, in addition to its crew, it has the capacity to transport 8 extra individuals or roughly 1 metric ton of cargo. It's all good news for the Navy SEALs, who will have the ability to be transported further faster and with more gear for their mission. The most important thing of all is that this dry submarine will be able to keep its SEALs dry and unencumbered, not exhausted from having to trudge through the ocean in their wetsuits for hours. Such a thing is going to be especially important in the event of a war against China, whose naval theater will be taking place in and over the islands of the Pacific and the South China Sea. In such a place, the DCS will greatly influence how the SEALs operate and help them expand their mission profiles. In practice, this would be any attempt to gain access to heavily guarded territory that the Chinese end up capturing and sealing off with naval mines. Our relationship with our submarine force has never been closer, Rear Admiral Hugh Howard III, Commander of Naval Special Warfare Command, told Senators in May 2023. He further explained, we see the undersea as absolutely critical to deterrence. I think that it is a place that we maintain advantage, and it is a place where we must maintain advantage to critically deter our peer adversaries. Memorial Day 2023 was initially penned as the day of introduction to service for the DCS, but Memorial Day came and went, and not much has been heard since. It's important to remember that many of the most interesting details about the DCS are still classified. We don't truly know about its surveillance capabilities and the kind of navigation or guidance system it uses for moving under the sea. There has even been a test where a DCS was dropped from a C-17 Globemaster transport jet. What SOCOM actually has in mind with such a delivery system is yet to be seen. It's unclear how many units SOCOM and the Navy expect to purchase in the coming years, but it can be reasonably assumed that the total fleet size will be small. Its application will not be ideal in absolutely every instance, and the Mark 11 wet submersible is also being developed to replace the original Mark 8 for shorter distance mission targets. In any case, naval special operations may be about to reach a different level of capability entirely. 
Now we'd love it if you sent a submarine payload at the subscribe button. Consider giving this video a thumbs up as well if you like what you've seen. Thanks for watching.